She's smiling at the subway. She crap on man. I'd love to serve sweet bone eyes. I'm without a plan. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. Um, anyway, I am here, sorry about the spinning around, here at the wonderful Fat Cats. If you ever happen to be in the Rexburg area, if you ever happen to be visiting BYU, Idaho, this is a great place to come. It's got a lot, a lot of things. It's got a bowling alley. It's got a VR room, a virtual reality room. It's got putt-putt golf. It's got an arcade. It's got a lot of cinemas. I think there are one, I think there are like 10. Don't quote me on that. I'm not sure. But this is a wonderful place. It's also, they deliver the food right to your seat. So like you can get pizza, you can get hamburgers, hot dogs, nachos, you can get what a ton of stuff here at Fat Cats. And they'll actually deliver it right to your seat while you're watching the movie so that you can come order your stuff, let it get ready, go to your seat, and then be watching the movie and they'll bring you your food without having to worry about, oh, hey, my buzzer went off, I've got to go get my food now, or or whatever the other case may be. I love this place. Now, I, unfortunately, I'm not sponsored by Fat Cats. I'd love to be. But another great thing about Fat Cats is, if you want a sit-down place to eat too, right next door to it is a great place called Wingers. There's also um, quite a few other little places just behind me on the other side where you can't see, there's uh, Costa Vida. There's um, a Mongolian grill coming in there. There's a uh, sushi place. There is, um, shoot, uh, Cold Stone Creamery. There is, it's, anyway, there's a bunch of restaurants over there. There's also Jack in the Box if you want something kind of, you know, cheap instead. There, uh, there's a lot to do just right here. You could spend an afternoon here having fun, having a little family reunion or something like that. Anyway, you guys didn't come here to hear me rant about movies and things like that. You did come to hear, though, chapter 44 of Proven Guilty, book 8 of the Dresden Files. Again, that's chapter 44. So if you've missed those uh, previous books, those previous chapters, or things like that, do go ahead and take a look down in the playlists below. Also, if you know of fun and exciting places around you that are good to come see, good to come um, spend an afternoon at, go ahead and leave comments down below. And let's go ahead and see kind of what places around, around the world or around my viewers that people find exciting and people find fun and maybe I will uh, come and do a reading or something near it or come and do something fun near that place or maybe even just uh, give a shout out and say hey I've been there that place is awesome but anyway let's go ahead here and jump into chapter 44 uh, last chapter I was able to get through without getting all choked up let's go ahead and see how this one does and whilst you guys are reading along in your book, please do make sure to like, share, and subscribe because our goal of hitting 1,000 subscribers before um, the end of January 2019, let's see if we can do that. Anyway, let's go ahead and jump here into chapter 44. My mechanic's skills bordered on the supernatural. He left word with me that the beetle was ready to resume active duty and that for and that while it didn't look like much the car would roll when i pushed the pedals which was all i really needed it to do so molly and i rolled up to the lakeside warehouse where i'd met with a council at the start of this mess 
When I shut down the engine, the beetle rattled and shuddered hard enough to click my teeth together before it died. It continued wheezing and clicking for several seconds afterwards. Molly stared out ahead of her, her face pale. Is this the place? The run-down old warehouse looked different in the orange evening light than it had at high noon. Shadows were longer and darker and emphasized the flaws and dents of the building, given the place a much more run-down, abandoned appearance than I had remembered. There were fewer cars there as well, and it gave the place an even more abandoned atmosphere. That's the place, I said quietly. You ready? She swallowed. Sure, she said, but she looked frightened and very, very young. What comes next? I got out of the car as an answer, and Molly followed suit. I squinted around, but no one was in sight until the air shimmered about twenty feet away and Ramirez stepped out of the veil that had hidden him. Carlos Ramirez was the youngest wizard ever given the post of regional commander in the wardens. He was average height, his skin glowing with bronze health, and he wore both the gray cloak of the wardens and one of their, or rather, our, except that I don't have one, silver swords at his left hip. At his right, he wore a heavy semi-automatic and a holster, and his military-style web belt also bore several hand grenades. Good veil, I said. Way better than the other day. I wasn't here the other day, he assured me with bland confidence. Your work? I asked. I make it look easy, he said without a trace of modesty. It's a curse to be so damned talented when I'm already obscenely good looking, but I try to soldier on as best I can. I laughed and offered him my hand. He shook it. Dresden, he said. Ramirez, I said, and nodded to my right. This is Molly Carpenter. He glanced at the girl, looking her up and down. Miss, he said, without a polite bow of his head. He glanced at me, indicated a direction with his hand, and said, They're ready for you. But walk with me for a minute. I need to talk to you. He glanced at Molly. Privately. I arched a brow at him. Molly, I'll be right back. She bit her lip and nodded. Oh, uh, okay. Miss, Ramirez said with a somewhat apologetic smile, I need you to remain exactly where you are standing right now. All right? Oh, hell's bells, I muttered. You think she's that dangerous? He thinks it's security protocol. Ramirez said. If you didn't want me doing it, you shouldn't have asked me. I started to snarl an answer, but I choked it down and said, fine. Molly, just there for now. I won't go out of sight of you. She nodded, and I turned with Ramirez. We walked several paces away over the gravel before he asked, that the kid? Ramirez wasn't old enough to get good car insurance rates himself much less to refer to someone as kid. Though he had been through and grew up swiftly. He'd been an apprentice when the war with the Red Court erupted, and he'd done good service for the council upon attaining status as a full wizard, fighting in several nasty engagements with the vampires. It was the kind of thing that made a man age in a hurry. That's her. I confirmed. Did you get a chance to examine the victims? Yeah. He frowned and watched me for a moment before he said, She's someone you know? He nodded. He glanced back at her. Crud. I frowned at him. Why? I don't think today is going to go well for her, Ramirez said. My stomach suddenly felt cold. Why not? Because of how the battle in Oregon played out, he said. Once the forces from Summer attacked their rear, we gave the vamps one hell of a beating. Morgan, 
got within about 20 feet of the Red King himself. Morgan killed him? No, but it wasn't for lack of trying. He cut down a duke and a pair of counts before the Red King got away. Damn, I said impressed. But what does that have to do with Molly? We had the Reds by the balls, Ramirez said. Sunrise was coming in the real world, and when they tried to retreat into the Never Never, the fairies were on them like a school of piranha. The Reds had to find a way to draw off some of the heavies, and they found it. Lucio's boot camp. I drew in a breath. They attacked Lucio? And the newbies? Yeah. McCoy listens to wind, and Martha Liberty led a force from the battle to relieve the camp. They did, huh? Um, how did it go? He took a deep breath and said, They haven't reported in yet. And that means... It means that my support in the senior council isn't here to help me. Ramirez nodded. Who has their proxies? We didn't hear from you until after they had left, so they didn't entrust their proxies to anyone. I sighed. So the Merlin holds them all by default? And he doesn't much like me. He'd cast the votes to condemn her just to spite me. It gets better, he said. Ancient Mai is still in Indonesia. And La Fortier is covering the Venturi while they relocate. The Merlin has their votes, too. And I don't think the gatekeeper is coming. So the only one whose opinion counts is the Merlin? I said. Pretty much. Then Ramirez frowned at me. You don't look too surprised. I'm not, I said. If something can go wrong, it does. And I've accepted that by now. He tilted his head. I've just told you the kid will probably be found guilty before she's even tried. Yeah, I said. I chewed on my lip. This would make things more difficult. I had been counting on at least a little help from Ebenezer and his cronies. They knew the council procedures better than I did. And how to manipulate them. They also knew the Merlin, who, magical talents aside, was a damned slippery fish when it came to maneuvering through a council meeting. The Merlin had every reason to oppose me, and therefore Molly. Now, if he wielded the votes of the people I'd been counting on to support me, he could literally be Molly's judge, jury, and executioner. Well, judge and jury, anyway. Morgan would do the executing. I ground my teeth. My plan could still work, theoretically, but there was very little I could do to alter the outcome from here on in. I glanced back at Molly. Here we were. I'd brought her to this turn. I'd see it through. Fine, I said. I, I can deal th with this. Ramirez arched an eyebrow at me. I thought you'd look more upset. Would it help me anything if I started foaming at the mouth? No, Ramirez said. It might explain a few things, but it wouldn't help, per se. Water, bridge, I said. Split milk. Accept things you cannot change. In other words, you have a plan, Ramirez said. I shrugged and smiled tightly at him, and just then a low, throbbing engine approached the old warehouse. Ramirez's hand went to the butt of his gun. Easy, I told him. I invited them. A motorcycle wound its way through the maze of alleys and portholes between warehouses, and then crunched to a stop in the gravel beside the Blue Beetle. Fix flipped the bike's kickstand down, and then he and Lily got off the motorcycle. Flix Fix flipped me a little salute, and I nodded back at him. Ramirez arched an eyebrow and said, Is that who I think it is? Summer night and lady, I confirmed. Well, crap, he said and scowled at me. You're going to turn this into some kind of fight? 
loss, High Child chided him. Why would I do that? He gave me a steady look and then said, You just had to ask me to handle security. What can I say, man? No one else was pretty and talented enough. No one is talented that you couldn't make him look bad, Dresden, he muttered. And then he gave Lily and Fix a calculating look and said, Well, this should be interesting at any rate. Introduce me. Yep, I did. Then Ramirez led us through the veil, protecting the warehouse from perception. Two wardens at the door searched everyone for weapons. They even had one of the animate statues of a temple dog they used to detect hostile enchantments, veils, and concealed weaponry. The stone construct made me a little nervous. I had nearly been attacked by one over a false alarm once. But this time it passed me by without showing any interest. It lingered longest on Molly, once emitting a grindstone growl, but it subsided after a moment and returned to its post beside the door. I started to go inside, but Ramirez touched my arm. I stopped and frowned at him. He glanced at Molly and drew a black cloth from his belt. You've got to be kidding me, I said. It's protocol, Harry. It's sadistic and unnecessary. He shook his head. I'm not offering an option here. He lowered his voice so that only I could hear him. I don't like it either. But if you violate protocol now, especially in a case that involves mind control magic, it will be all the excuse the Merlin needs to declare the proceedings potentially compromised. He'll be to pass a summary judgment on the girl and put you and me both on precautionary probation. I ground my teeth. But Ramirez was right. I remembered when I'd been brought before the council for the first time. One thing, more than any other, stuck in my memory of that night. The scent of the black cloth hood they'd had over my head, over my face. It had smelled slightly of dust, slightly of mothballs, and no light whatsoever had come through to me. Some terrified corner of my brain had noted that so long as the hood was over my face, I wasn't really a person. I was only a creature, a statistic, and one that was a potential threat at that. It would be far easier to pass and mete out a death sentence when one did not have to look at the face of the damned. I took the hood from Ramirez and turned to Molly. Don't be afraid. I told her quietly, I am not going anywhere. She stared back into my eyes, terrified and trying to look brave. She swallowed and nodded once, then closed her eyes. I cast a resentful look at the warehouse. Then I slipped the hood over Molly's pink and blue hair and pulled it down over her pale face. Good enough? I asked Ramirez. It wasn't fair of me to blame him for it. But the note of accusation in my voice came through far more strongly than I had intended. Ramirez glanced away, shame on his face now, and nodded. And then he held open the warehouse door. I took Molly's hand and led her inside. Thank you for listening to Chapter 44. <clears throat> Hopefully you guys were able to uh, like, subscribe, and to share this video with others. I did want to also thank you guys so, so very much for all that you've done, all the many, many wonderful things, the, um, ah, excuse me, the uh, support, the hope, the love that you guys have shown me, and I do hope that you guys all have a wonderful and blessed day.